Hello, I'm Kate Jabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. When a missile hit a Polish village, killing two people, the finger was immediately pointed at Russia. But now it's being called an unfortunate accident as Ukraine tried to defend itself. Just how perilous was this moment? The longer this war goes on, the more vulnerable we are to accidental or deliberate escalation and all our countries being brought into a military confrontation with Russia. Professor of Defence Studies Michael Clark and open source investigator Elliot Higgins will explain how the true facts were established. And we report from Poland as hundreds of British troops deployed there go on exercise. Poland is now central to the defence of NATO's eastern flank and we have to practice what we potentially could be asked to do. Also this week, there's no claim of job finished, but British troops are leaving Mali. We should be clear that responsibility for all of this sits in Bamako. Two coups in three years have undermined international efforts to advance peace. Mistakes, miscalculations, misunderstandings. We've spoken many times on SITREP about how those moments can change the course of history. On Tuesday evening, there was a moment that had the potential to put NATO and Russia in direct conflict. But the story evolved rapidly and very significantly in the hours that followed. Just a little bit of breaking news. The Associated Press is quoting a senior US intelligence official as saying that uh, Russian missiles crossed into Poland, killing two people. And we start with breaking news this hour. Poland's prime minister is calling an urgent meeting of the National Security Council. What this looks like, frankly, is a, a Russian missile that has fallen almost certainly accidentally. Of course, we know that all day Russia was attacking Ukraine with rockets, but we don't have any conclusive evidence at the moment as to who launched this missile. Well, the absolute top priority is to establish what actually happened, because if anybody takes decisions on poor information, then we're bound to make poor decisions. It's probably unlikely Russia would choose to target a random grain silo in a village with a population of just 400. Our preliminary analysis suggests that the incident was likely caused by a Ukrainian air defense missile fired to defend Ukrainian territory. So how did we get from suspected Russian attack to an accident of friendly fire? We'll dig into that process shortly. But first, Mike, how perilous a moment was this? Is it just good luck that means it didn't turn into a NATO versus Russia war? No, it, it was a perilous moment for the media, but not for anybody in authority, I think. I, you know, when this happened, uh, my phone was pinging away for the, the next few hours and I didn't take any calls on it. And the fact is, all of those people who mattered in NATO and in Poland, apart from Kiev itself, I mean, President Zelensky immediately said it was a Russian missile, but everybody else said, let us wait until we know. And the forensics on these sorts of things, given that it landed in NATO territory, meant that it would get a proper forensic examination within about 24 hours. So let us wait until we know. And I think there, there was something to be said for everybody who was important stayed very calm and very measured. And it was the media that really had a bit of a crisis over it. Well, also with us is Elliot Higgins, founder of the open source investigative group Bellingcat. Elliot, obviously state level <coughs> intelligence agencies work quickly to establish the facts. So did open source investigators like you and your colleagues at Bellingcat. How do you go about identifying what type of missile has been used? Well, the, the first thing is waiting for imagery to come from the site that shows the debris of the um, munition that was used. And in this case, we actually had those images quite swiftly. It's then a case of kind of looking at the fragments of metal, looking at the details and seeing if it matches known <clears throat> munitions used elsewhere. In this case, you know, there was the allegation it was a, some sort of Russian missile, a cruise missile of some sort. And unfortunately, we have many, many examples of the debris of cruise missiles after their attacks in Ukraine. But gives us a vast amount of reference imagery. We also have reference imagery for other missiles, one of which was the uh, missiles used by the S-300 air defense system. And it became very clear that the debris was matching with the air defense system missile rather than any kind of Russian cruise missile. Uh, and Mike, this S-300 air defense missile is a type used by both Ukraine and Russia. How confident can we be less than 48 hours on that this is correct? 
Well, uh, I mean, I'm as confident as Bellingcat can be because I use Bellingcat's material all, all the time. I use a lot of these things, and I have to say that Bellingcat are the best in the business. You know, what Elliot says, I'm sure, is right, that, that it looked like an S, uh, a Salmon S300 um, air defence portions of the engine. The question I still can't quite reconcile is the size of the crater, which we'd like to know a bit more about. But, I mean, if it was an older S300, they carried big warheads of maybe 130 kilograms. I mean, that would make a crater that size. If it was a more modern S300 missile, then they only carry small warheads of about um, 30 or 40 kilograms because they don't need to because they're much more accurate. So a lot depends on whether this was a, a more modern or an older um, S-300 missile, but I'm very confident from what we've seen so far and what Bellingcat have said about it that that seems to be, that's part of the wreckage. Whether there's anything else to discover in the wreckage, I wouldn't be surprised if there is, but the part of the wreckage we're sure about certainly points in the direction of it being a, a Ukrainian air defence missile. Elliot, can, can you enlighten us at all about the size of the crater? Well, um, I think one thing that will help things become clearer is the information that comes from official sources about what they detected on the various systems, about you know the trajectory of Russian rockets, the response of air defence systems by Ukraine. I really think this visual confirmation of what the debris is really is more about making sure that people address these claims with more caution. I mean, certainly the media was all over the claims that this was a Russian missile striking Poland, but it's unfortunate it got to the point it did because we, of course, now have Russia using this these claims to actually attack the um, verdict of the MH17 trial today. We've got Russian embassies today tweeting out that because the media and some officials got it wrong on what happened in Poland, that it must also be the case with MH17, which I think is very unfortunate. And the other big part of the puzzle is identifying where the missile has come from. How possible is it to determine its origin or at least the direction it travels? Well, it would depend really. Um, I mean, it's, it's difficult to confirm the direction it traveled from just by the nature of these kind of, these are, you know, guided missiles. So they aren't dumb rockets where it's easy to measure the trajectory. But we also need to keep in mind that there is, you know, not much debris left of this missile. So it's not really possible at the moment to identify the exact type of uh, variation of missile this is, which would then help us tell which warhead it is, whether or not Russia has these in stock, whether or not Ukraine has these in stock. So even though we can say it's this type of missile, there are still kind of other questions that need to be answered. But I, I think this initial claim that it was a Russian missile that was targeting Poland was uh, is, is clearly been shown not to be true. And uh, Mike, will Polish authorities have extra information to work with to make their judgment and perhaps be more certain, or does open source offer it all? Oh no, they've got. I, they'll have other information that we won't see. I'm fairly sure because I mean NATO has been running Sentinel missions all over the territory. I mean, you know, our own RC 135s have been in, in action. Whether they were there at the time or not, I don't know. But I mean, NATO aircraft, particularly when the Russians are attacking, the launching these air attacks, NATO aircraft are up in the sky, just on the edge of, of Ukrainian airspace, logging everything that is being done. And so I'm fairly certain that NATO intelligence um, will have the track of the Ukrainian missile and probably the track of the Russian missile it was probably fired at. And I'm guessing there'll be a track of two missiles that they'll be very interested in. I'm sure they won't release those, um, but nevertheless, they will know they will know what the origin of the both Ukrainian missile and the Russian missile may have been. And although, I mean, as Elliot says, the Russians are making great play of the fact that this was m mistaken, it wasn't mistaken from a NATO point of view. NATO said, let's wait until we know. And when they knew, within 24 hours, they said, this is not a Russian missile. There is a degree of real honesty in the way NATO handled this. And although the Russians will spin it, uh, the rest of the world can see that NATO is acting in as truthful a way as it can. Mm. Elliot, um, you mentioned the MH17 trial uh, today. This is where the plane was brought down over Crimea, shot down. And uh, in incidents like the one in Poland and assessments that we've had so far, it gives rise to misinformation, conspiracy theories online. How much of that has there been in this case? Well, not really that many. I mean, it, because I think it actually was fairly rapid from the point of kind of confusion about who fired the missile to the point where we actually understood what was happening or had a clear picture at least. I think it kind of reduced that to a certain extent. There are some people trying to claim this is an attempt at a Ukrainian false flag, but that's not really something that's really being pushed too heavily at the moment. 
maybe that'll change. Maybe Russia will need a distracting distraction from the MH17 verdict today, so they'll start pushing other conspiracy theories. But um, I really don't think it's kind of being able to enter those kind of counterfactual communities in the way that something like MH17 did. Elliot Higgins from Bellingcat, thank you so much for your time. Well, I just want to play a couple of reactions from the Prime Minister and NATO Secretary General on Wednesday when consensus was building that the strike in Poland was a Ukrainian accident. The reason we're even having this conversation is because yesterday Russia rained down over 80 missile strikes. This is not Ukraine's fault. Russia bears ultimate responsibility as it continues its illegal war against Ukraine. Uh, Mike, is this incident going to have any lasting impact or does it turn out to be a blip in this war? Yeah, I'm sure it's a blip. Um, I mean, these things will happen, but it's a reminder that this war is dangerous and that the, the Russians want the war to be, in a sense, escalated, at least rhetorically, to other NATO areas because they want to frighten everybody that, that the, the crisis could become a, a more general European war. So although this is not a particularly important incident, although tragically two people died, the Russians have an interest in keeping this going as a way of frightening the West into worrying about where the war is going to go next. And even before this missile strike, Poland had been growing increasingly concerned about the risks of contagion from the Ukraine war. Britain is one of the NATO nations that has bolstered Poland's defences in recent years and even more so in recent months. Rosie Layden has been in Poland watching British forces on the Allied exercise Puma 22. Poland, once an enemy of NATO back in the Cold War, now has more than a thousand NATO troops stationed here. And it hosts NATO military exercises like this one, Puma 22, involving scores of tanks and around 2,000 troops. The British tank squadron taking part was sent earlier in the year to bolster Poland's defences after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Very much welcomed by Poland's Prime Minister, Mateusz Morawiecki, who's on a drive to significantly increase defence spending. The alternative is what we see in Ukraine. The alternative is murdered women and children, bombed cities, bombed power plants. We do not want such an alternative. It's a process the UK wants to support. Colonel Tom Blythe is the UK defence attaché to Poland. Obviously, Poland is now central geographically to the defence of NATO's eastern flank, which also means that conceptually and practically it is also, it's also central and we have to practice what uh, we potentially could be asked to do uh, on the ground and with the people and the forces that we're going to have to operate with. There are currently around 600 British troops in Poland, with a light recce squadron in the north and personnel from 7 Air Defence Group manning the Sky Sabre anti-aircraft missile system at key sites around the country. In the south, there are approximately 130 soldiers and nine Challenger 2 tanks from the Queen's Royal Hussars. These Challenger 2 tanks are part of a squadron from the Queen's Royal Hussars who've been embedded with the Poles since June. They're here to plug a gap in Polish capability after Warsaw sent a number of their tanks to Ukraine. Five months in, the QRH are joining Polish, Czech, Slovakian, Hungarian and American soldiers for exercise Puma 22, just a few hundred kilometres from the Polish border with Ukraine. And Colonel Di Bevan, the commander of Operation Kabrit, the UK's contribution to NATO in this region, is taking a close interest. Puma is all about us making sure that we have the, the necessary defensive capabilities um, on this side of the border. So should there be a requirement to defend you know, either Poland or elsewhere within the alliance, our forces are able to operate really closely alongside each other. Colonel Robert Bere is the commander of Poland's 21st Podale Rifles Brigade, who are running exercise Puma 22. Firepower is, uh, is very important. The war in Ukraine uh, shows us uh, everything. If you have a power, firepower, you are more flexible. Also, it's a, it's a kind of show of force for, for Putin's hordes. And during their time in Poland, the Queen's Royal Hussars have also gained greater understanding of what it means to live so close to the Russian threat. Major Charlie Gray is the OC of A Squadron. I think one thing that 
we all kind of failed to understand before we came out here was just um, to what extent the conflict has um, taken its toll on the sort of um, families and the well-being of, of the soldiers over here in Poland. Clearly, being in this part of the world, it's, it comes with those threats um, and they're sort of very alive to that. But it's been something that has definitely affected us and we've, we've learned a lot from them about that. And the recent missile deaths will have done nothing to steady Polish nerves. Rosie Lane reporting from Poland. Next to Mali, where almost a decade of British military presence is being brought to an abrupt end. Since 2013, when Islamist militants came to the brink of taking over the country, UK troops have deployed in various roles, training Mali's own forces, helping a large French military mission, and most recently as part of the UN peacekeeping force MINUSMA. But France withdrew from Mali earlier this year. Canada, Sweden and others have followed suit. Now Britain is withdrawing from MINUSMA a year early. Armed Forces Minister James Heapy told MPs the blame for this lay squarely with Mali's military government, which seized power in a coup in 2020. The Malian government began working with the Russian mercenary group Wagner and actively sought to interfere with the work of both the French-led and UN missions. The Wagner group is linked to mass human rights abuses. The Malian government's partnership with Wagner group is counterproductive to lasting stability and security in their region. Mr Speaker, this government cannot deploy our nation's military to provide security when the host country's government is not willing to work with us to deliver lasting stability and security. Britain's withdrawal takes 300 soldiers out of a UN force of more than 11,500. But their role has been a specialised one, providing a long-range reconnaissance group on the UN's most dangerous peacekeeping mission. So how much of a difference will the UK's exit make? Retired General Philip Breedlove is NATO's former Supreme Allied Commander Europe. Well, the numbers don't sound impressive, but I think you need to really look at what the capability of a British long range reconnaissance group is. This is a very specialized capability. The Brit forces are some of the best in the world at this mission. And, and I believe they're going to be missed. They're going to have to work hard to replace that kind of credibility capability in the field. The UK is being fiercely critical of Mali's ruling junta for inviting in Wagner, the Russian mercenary group. How concerned are you about their presence and influence in Mali? Uh, I'm incredibly concerned. Listen, we have seen the Wagner group and how they comport themselves in the Ukraine conflict. And as you know, this conflict is, is, is immoral, illegal, horrific, and the Wagner group is a part of it. And so we don't need that kind of force uh, acting around the world. With that as a background, I completely support the UK decision to pull their troops. I don't think we want to be associated, we the West, my country or your country, want to be associated with working with the Wagner Group in the field. And if we step back from worries about Wagner's motives, methods and influence, what about their capability? Are they a capable enough operation to hold Islamist insurgents at bay in Mali? Well, I, I think maybe they are. I, uh, clearly, they have demonstrated in Ukraine that they're a brutal group and that they have some capability. Uh, my guess, though, is that their best are going to Ukraine. And so it leaves one to wonder what kind of professionalism we'll see in Mali. And I don't think it pretends well for us to expect professional behavior out of that group. And if we look at the big picture of keeping Islamist insurgency contained in Mali and across the Sahel, it feels a long way from London and Washington. Does it matter to us? Could it become a threat to the West? Of course it matters. I mean, you don't have to look back very much farther than 9-11 to understand if there are ungoverned spaces where these terrorists are allowed to act and have freedom to maneuver, they will export their terror. So we do have to be concerned. 
General Philip Breedlove, uh, Michael Clark, one of the reasons given by the Armed Forces Minister for ending Britain's contribution in Mali was effectively that it fails a Chilcot test from the Iraq inquiry that the military instruments should not be deployed on counterinsurgency or countering violent extremism missions unless there is a clear and compelling commitment towards political progress. Is this the first time we've seen a public recognition of those Iraq inquiry lessons being applied to UK military operations? I think it is. I think it's the first time we've seen them quoted like that. But what's interesting, and I can tell you that the Chilcot principles are used quite a lot inside government. One of the parliamentary committees that I'm involved with took evidence last year from uh, Stephen Lovegrove when the National Security Council was still in existence. His officials were saying then that they have Chilcot principles as a sidebar on a lot of their briefings printed on the, on the pages that they use. And that sidebar was the Chilcot test sidebar of things that they've got to keep in mind. So I'm, I'm fairly um, impressed by the fact that the, you know, the Chilcot inquiry, which took a lot of uh, criticism at the time because it took so long and it was just so huge. Actually, it's not just been put on the shelf and forgotten that Whitehall does recognise that Chilcot identified systemic failings, groupthink, which was not good for strategy, and that those ideas really are, as it were, taken to heart by officials as they work policy through. But I think this is the first time I can remember the Chilcot test um, principles being quoted by a minister in parliament. The Islamist militant threat that took British forces to Mali in the first place needs to be seen in a wider context of the Sahel region of Africa. Stretching from the Atlantic in West Africa to the Red Sea in the east, the UK says the threat from Al-Qaeda and IS-linked jihadists has largely moved away from the area where Mali, Niger and Burkina Faso meet and instead has driven further south into Burkina. We can now speak to Paul Melly, an expert on the Sahel and consulting fellow at Chatham House. Oh, Paul, do you share the UK's assessment of where the Islamist threat is now based, that it's largely out of Mali and instead has a centre of mass in Burkina Faso? Uh, no, I, I think the UK in making that judgment has got it a bit wrong. Certainly the threat is moving south and there is now a serious threat to the sort of northern reaches of coastal countries such as Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Togo and Benin. But the violent instability, which is largely the work of jihadist groups, but which also has other contributing factors, intercommunal violence, for example, that still remains a really serious problem in Mali. And it's a serious threat to Western Niger. So I can see the logic behind the UK's withdrawal because of conditions in Mali, but it wouldn't be fair to say that Mali no longer poses a problem even if it does make sense for the UK to redeploy, to focus its own support on helping coastal countries. And of the different Islamist militants that are involved in the region, what are their stated aims and how much of a threat do they pose beyond the territories they're in? One of their aims, in theory, is the creation of some sort of Islamic caliphate. But in practice, it's just become a much wider general sort of destabilizing and disrupting violence that has largely broken up the normal functioning of government, public services, local administration in the center of the Sahel. And at community level, it's also been about replacing those state structures and traditional authorities with a degree of what you might call jihadist ideological influence. And Paul, the UK will be part of a meeting of the ACRA initiative next week. This is a West African-led programme trying to tackle the spread of Islamist insurgency. How much Western military support have they got in the region at the moment and how much do they need? Well, what they probably need is specialist support for the kind of intelligence and uh, special forces operations that are needed to secure their northern border regions, because we've seen over the last couple of years, it's beginning to become an active threat rather than just a security worry. At the moment, they're getting some specialist support from Western countries, particularly from France. Uh, France has been working out new forms of support for Benin, the French have a lot of troops based in Côte d'Ivoire permanently, but down on the coast. But there is also 
uh, an academy to train West African forces against terrorism in Jacquesville in Côte d'Ivoire. So this isn't quite the scale of security crisis that we're seeing in the what you might call the core Sahelian countries like Burkina Faso or Mali. Uh, but the, the intention is to try and move now to forestall before things get much worse. And do you think we could or should see British troops deployed elsewhere in Africa after the withdrawal from Mali? I think that British troops, because English is the language of Ghana, British forces are probably quite well suited to working with the Ghanaian military, especially in training them in some of the more specialist tasks or providing technical support or intelligence. It's going to require quite a bit of coordination because for the Central Sahel, the French and the Americans with aerial surveillance from satellites and drones have a sort of well-developed intelligence surveillance coverage of the centre of the Sahel, how far that is yet being extended down into the coastal countries and whether Britain itself will need to provide capacity or whether it will be, as it were, supplied with aerial capacity by the Americans, it remains to be seen. Paul Melly, good to speak to you. Thank you very much for your time. You're very welcome. Now, amid everything else going on this week, a story that might otherwise have dominated headlines has passed barely noticed. On Tuesday, 150 miles off the coast of Oman, the Royal Navy went to the aid of an oil tanker which had been hit by a projectile. The US now says the MV Pacific Zircon was attacked by an Iranian drone, probably a Shahed 136, the so-called suicide drone being used by Russia in Ukraine. Michael Clark, it's not the first time we've seen a commercial ship attacked and the finger of blame pointed at Iran. But why would Iran want to do this? What's in it for them? I think they would have. They did it because of who owns the ship. I mean, it's owned by uh, Idan Ofer, who's one of the richest men in Israel. It's an Israeli-owned ship, company based in uh, Singapore. Um, and last year, uh, Idan's brother, Eel, his ship, the Mercer Street, was struck in a similar way. And mm-hmm. so I think that's quite significant that the Iranians are going for strikes against Israeli-owned ships. And the two, I mean, the Ofer brothers are, I think, they're two of the richest people, if not the richest people in Israel. And these strikes are neither here nor there in military terms. I mean, these ships, the uh, Pacific Zircon's a 28,000 tonne tanker. And so a, a, an Iranian drone is just going to cause some superstructure damage at best. Having said that, last year, a couple of people were killed on the, uh, the Mercer Street. So it's not that they are without danger, but the, these are pinprick attacks in order to make a point. And almost certainly, in my view, they'll be orchestrated by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard because they almost act on their own and they keep up this constant sense of opposition to anything Western and particularly anything Israeli um, going on in, around the Gulf. And Mike, the Royal Navy was, according to the US, first to respond. What kind of help can they give in a situation like that? I think it's just checking out that everything's OK. Any any damage that can they can help repair or replace any component for them that, that can help them get to a, a port if they needed to. I don't think anything like that was required in this case. But, you know, in the, regardless of the politics of it, the maritime ethos is that any ship that may be in any, any sort of trouble, then you go and check them out. You go and see what you can do to help. Any ship will mm. help any other ship. and And that's just in the nature of maritime affairs. You described it as a pinprick attack. Is there likely to be any response from the West? No, I think the West will just log this. It's, it's part of the charge sheet against uh, Iran at the moment. I mean, there's not much chance of re- resurrecting the nuclear deal now. The Iranians have more or less turned their back on that. And I think everybody's just standing watching because the Iranian government is now in deep trouble because, in effect, they've taken on the young women of Iran as their adversary. And I suspect that they they are finding that they've taken on the most formidable opponent that they've yeah. faced since 1979. The young women of Iran with their hair uncovered, it frightens the daylights out of the mullahs and it threatens to bring down their regime. Professor Michael Clark, thank you. And my thanks to all of our guests. That's just about it for now. But we have more for you online in an extra edition of the SITREP podcast. After the liberation of Kherson, we'll hear from the city and ask what comes next in Ukraine. I speak at length with General Philip Breedlove about that and his frustration that the West is making Ukraine 
fight with one hand tied behind its back, as he puts it. That's online now at bfbs.com slash sitrep or wherever you download your podcasts. And don't forget, you can also catch up with the main programme every week on the Forces News YouTube's channel. We're back next Thursday. For now, though, from me, Kate Chabot. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. 